All right, hi everybody. This is going to be chapter five and chapter five as practice problems slash solved problems. We're going to go over some of the quantitative work from uh, this chapter in this video uh, to help you get your problem sets done and to help you solve the quantitative work by hand on your quizzes. So for this week, um, the first thing we're going to discuss is something uh, from the PowerPoint. I've taken some of the slides out again to just look at the quantitative work. And so this problem has to do with measuring how effective a system is being. We discussed in the lecture how when you are looking at capacity, your um, output can be compared to either the effective capacity, meaning the capacity, including the idea that you don't have every possible, you know, the total number of workers you need to operate the machine at peak capacity, uh, the absolute maximum you could uh, crank out of this machine in terms of how many units you're going to produce, right? Um, that's what the design capacity is. The design capacity is what is the system designed to do? Maybe it's, uh, you know, 160 units in a day, right? Um, meanwhile, you only have the staff and the space to make 100 units a day. So you're measuring your output typically uh, toward, uh, compared to your effective capacity in terms of measuring how efficient your operations are. So if your actual output is 80, for example, um, and let me pull up the drawing tool real quick. Uh, if my actual uh, output is 80, and uh, normally I'm able to uh, uh, to get 100 units out if I had, um, well, that's a good drawing there. Uh, <laughs> let me erase that one, redraw that. Uh, then I would be at 80% efficiency, right? 80 divided by 100 is 80%. So um, we would say well, we're operating at 80% efficiency. And I can compare the efficiency one week to the efficiency another week to see if I am more efficient or not. Okay. Um, however, capacity in terms of what it's designed to do for utilization purposes. So you, how much, how much of the possible capacity am I actually using? So let's say I was designed where I could get 160 out under the optimum conditions. I had exactly the number of employees I need to operate the machine. I have all the um, storage I need to put that inventory. Um, I have all the financial resources I need, all of the raw materials I need. Well, I might be able to get 160 out in a day. And if I made 80 under those circumstances, 80 divided by 160 is 50%. So you're at 50% utilization. That's not as important from a day-to-day -day standpoint, but the utilization rate might matter in case, well, maybe we want to lease out part of our um, you know, facilities or we want to uh, hire or, or contract ourselves out to another company to make something for them. Maybe we're a shoe factory and we can make some extra shoes for you know, um, a private label like a, like a Target or a Walmart you know, or, or Reebok or Adidas. And then Target or Walmart says, hey, do you have any capacity to make these shoes? We really need an extra shoe run, you know, with our label on them or whatever. Yeah, we've got some capacity. We just need to pay some overtime or, um, you know, uh, hire some temporary workers or you need to provide us with extra financial re or, you know, raw materials for it. And then we'll do it for a percentage of the revenue or whatever. Right. So utilization is, is for um, um, those kind of decisions, really. Um, but they also help inform your your um, decisions on, on other things. I had um, uh, an example on that. You know, I uh, you know, if it, it, the poker room I managed in, in one city, you know, we looked at do we need to expand the room? Well, during peak hours, you know, we're, we're at capacity. But, you know, for, for other times of the day, we're only using half of the tables in the room. Right. So do we need to build a more more. Uh, uh, more tables and expand out the walls to, to, or could we run promotions to maybe try to shift some of the business into those lower uh, peak hours? And then, um, you know, so it helps make other decisions, right? Your, your actual utilization, right? Okay. So really that's all we're going to cover. And, and doing this in Excel is as simple as doing equals this divided by equals that, right? Having the actual output in one box having the effective capacity or the design capacity in another box equals this one divided by this one. So I'm not gonna go into that on the practice problems in Excel. Um, it's really just that simple. 
Uh, the only tricky thing here is remembering which one matches up with efficiency, which one matches up with utilization, right? Which one's effective, which one's designed. And I think the easiest way to remember it is, uh, is these first three letters, efficiency and effective, both start with EFF. And that can be your little mnemonic device for helping keep that straight. All right. So that's what we're going through on that. Uh, and you can see the same same work being done here. Okay, so we're going to do cost value uh, cost volume analysis on Excel. Uh, the idea that um, your fixed costs plus all the variable costs, meaning the cost per unit times the amount of uh, quantity you actually make, that's all your variable cost. Those two costs combined are your total cost. And if you take your total cost and divide it by uh, revenue made or vice versa, then you can figure out the revenue per unit or the cost per unit or, you know. Um, so uh, that's the basic formula that you need to be aware of right here. Total cost equals fixed cost versus, plus uh, variable cost. And then this formula here as well, a break even point uh, we're going to cover, but we're going to switch to Excel now to cover those. So let me um, let's see here, I need to... Uh, there. All right. So problem one from chapter five, not five S, chapter uh, five says you have to decide whether to um, make an item that you need, uh, in which case you're going to have to pay $150,000 for the initial equipment cost in order to make it. And then it'll cost you $60 per unit. Okay. Uh, the other option, the other alternative is to not buy it, but rather to buy all the units you need from someone else for $80 a unit. So there's no initial upfront cost, but it costs you $20 more per unit uh, in, in cost. And then your annual volume doesn't change. It's the same between both. You're going to uh, need to make 12,000 of these units. Okay. So the question is, what's our total cost going to be for 12,000 units? if I was uh, um, making it or buying it, which is which is gonna cost me less money. And that's the choice I'll make. So to figure this out, we need to figure out the, uh, just the purely the total cost here, okay? So um, total costs are gonna be equal to your fixed cost plus your variable cost, all right? So to do this, I just need to take my fixed cost it equals my fixed cost plus my variable cost. And my total variable cost or the variable cost per unit, which is this lowercase v symbol, plus the number of units I produce. So e plus this times this. And with multiplication, I don't need to put it in parentheses. If it helps to visualize it, you can, um, you could add parentheses here just to help you visualize what's happening. The multiplication does occur first without the parentheses, just because Again, order of operations, multiplication will come before addition. So you don't have to add the parentheses here, but be aware of that when you're writing your formulas. If something doesn't look right, right, well, what am I doing wrong? It's potential that, you know, maybe this was addition in here. You do need to put parentheses around addition if you want it to happen before the multiplication, right? So 150,000 plus $60 times 12,000 plus whatever this comes out to. That's going to be my total cost if I make it. It's going to cost me eight hundred seventy thousand dollars to make it. Now, because I'm set up all in a in a column here with everything matching up uh, as far as where these cells are, I can just grab this little uh, box right here and drag it over, and it's going to copy my formula over for me. It just copies it right to the same references, just shift it over one. So no cost up front, zero dollars, but then it's going to cost me twelve thousand times eighty uh, per you know to make all those units. So as you can see, even though the initial front up cost was one hundred fifty thousand dollars, came out uh, came out ahead by uh, by making it, and that's because of the demand. If this demand went down, right? If this demand was let's say the demand was one, just to really put an extreme visualization on. If I made one unit, well, it's going to cost me one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So where wherein lies the, um, the the point of indifference there? Right. Um, in which uh, I cross over from one being a better decision to the other. What's that crossover point? And so to figure that out, um, I need to figure out how many units, if my demand was to go up or down, would one of these be a better decision? And likely, likely, yes. So you can see here that uh, because this one's less than this one, 
that the point is going to probably be is going to be less than twelve thousand units. There was a there was a point before the twelve thousand unit point that um, this crossover to where this would have been a better deal if my demand was lower. Uh, I'm sorry, this the other one would have been a better deal. So uh, the point of indifference. To, uh, there's a there's a longer formula in the book, but this is the one I would like you to to look at um, because it's a it's just a more concise formula to figure out the point of indifference. All you need to do is take the difference between your fixed cost and divide it by the difference between your variable costs. So yes, there's formulas in your book that tell you differently. I want you to ignore them because this is a much better way of doing it. It's simply the difference here divided by the difference here. Okay, so the difference between 150,000 and, and zero, if I if I want to visualize that, right, is is 150,000. Right? There's 150,000 minus zero. So this minus this, okay? And the difference here is just the higher one to minus the lower one, okay? This minus this, okay? And I just take this and I divide it by this one, okay? That, that's all there is to it. I take the difference here divided by the difference here. And if I take that equals this divided by this, I can see that 7,500 units is the point of indifference. So if I make less than 7,500 units, then, um, I'm better off uh, buying. I, I'm better off buying the equipment. If I make more than that, I, I'm better off. So whichever one is the better deal at twelve thousand, because I because I'm lowering it, you know it's going to be the other one that's a better deal when you get down to the point of indifference, because that point is lower than twelve thousand. So uh, this one's a good deal because I don't have to repay this one hundred fifty thousand. But once I have paid back the seventy five hundred, or I've made seventy five hundred units, I've I've broken even on my fixed cost. Okay. And then at, at that point, I can start um, uh, making more profit. All right. So point of the difference is that. And then um, from here, uh, we're going to look at the same problem again, but I'm, I'm, I've rewritten a little bit to ask you to not find total costs, but to find total profit. So it's it's a little different if you're looking at profit versus cost. Make sure you're looking at that. If, if you see revenue, right? Revenue and sales are the same thing, but profit is different. Profit is your revenue minus costs. So you make a bunch of sales, but it costs you so much money, you, have, you haven't turned a profit. So we're going to actually look at the profit volume here. If, uh, let's say that my expected demand was... Um, you know, between these two options, I have a, uh, I've, I've changed the numbers a little bit. Yeah. So in this case, uh, we're going to say we're going to sell this item for $100 per unit. So this one is $150,000, cost us $60 to make each one of these units. We're going to sell it for $100. So how much profit am I going to make if my demand was $7,500 a year, right? The previous point of indifference. How much profit am I going to make? Okay. Um, so in this case, uh, I, to find the profit of this, I need to take the, um, amount of, second, here we go. So I need to make, <laughs> all right, sorry about that. We need to figure out um, with this number of units, how much uh, revenue am I going to make? Let's figure that out first. Okay. So if we're thinking about it, if I made 7,500 units, and let's bust out the calculator, 7,500 units, then I'm going to make $100 in revenue per unit. Okay. That's what I'm going to sell it for. So times 100. And I could write that down and I get $750,000. Okay. This is write that number down somewhere off to the side. Now let's figure out what are my total costs going to be. Okay. Total costs are going to be 7,500 times 60, because that's the cost per unit. $450,000 here in variable costs. And then I've got a fixed cost of 150,000. So let's write that down. And my total costs are going to be my variable cost, my my number of units produced times variable cost. That's this four hundred fifty thousand there. 
I've got $150,000 of fixed cost. So that plus that is going to be my total cost. 600,000, great. Write that number down. And I can erase these because now I've got total revenue, total cost. So now that I have that, I can take one minus the other. And I have $150,000 in profit. So I could, if I was just solving the problem by hand, I would just write down 150,000, that'd be my answer. So let's look at that on Excel. A couple of ways we can do this problem. We can do it like I just did it, or we have another option to do it, which is to um, figure out our total, our total um, uh, gross profit first and then back out our fixed cost afterwards. So that's another option. So the other option, and we can do it by hand too, would be to say 7,500 units times the difference here. So 100 minus 60 is $40 a unit in profit times 7,500 sales, that's $300,000 in gross profit. Now subtract out our fixed cost, 150,000, and we get 150,000. So either way we can arrive at the same answer. So let's do both options on Excel as well, all right? So we have two options. One is figure out the revenue first and then back out all of our costs. So that would be uh, 7,500 units times $100 in revenue for each of these. Now I'm gonna subtract from that 7,500 units times $60 in costs. And then I'm gonna subtract from that the $150 in fixed cost and I get 150,000. So that's option A uh, on solving the problem. The other option would be to say equals 7,500 units times, open my parentheses, and I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna subtract this from this. And from there, I then, so that's my gross profit, so to speak, and then subtract out my costs. We get $150,000. Both of these actually have the same profit. That's because we have popped in the uh, point of indifference into this. But let's say it was uh, 7,000 units, 7,000 units. In this case, I would be expected at 7,000 units to make more profit by buying them, all right? or let's say it was 10,000 units or 10,000 units here, I could just change these numbers based on um, demand updates. I could say, if I make, if I plan on selling 10,000 units, then this one's the better option. So you can see by doing these as formulas where they are references and I'm not just typing in 7,500 into my formula, by doing that, and the reason we stress this so much in this class is because I can update my inputs as my demand forecast change and then my final answer changes. I can see the result of that. Uh, right away. All right, so let's look at the break-even point of both of these. How much money is it going to, how many units do I need to make before I have broken even, either option, right? So to break even, I just need to take my fixed cost and divide it by the difference between uh, revenue and variable cost per unit. This is called the um, uh, uh, profit margin contribution or uh, profit contribution. Few, a few ways of calling this, uh, there's another name for it too, but um, profit margin, how much am I co contributing to profit? So the difference between my revenue per unit and my variable cost per unit, that's what I'm contributing to getting back to even and then eventually making profit. So in that case, I need to start with my 150,000 and then divide it by the difference, which is 100 minus 60. So very similar to that point of a difference formula except I'm not finding the difference between the two options first. I'm not taking this minus this, this minus this, this minus this first. I'm simply taking in this column, 150,000, I'm in the hole. And then how many units do I have to make? You know, 100 minus 60 is $40. So I'm getting out of that hole $40 at a time for every unit I sell. But realistically, I'm taking 150,000 and dividing it by 40, which is 3,750. That's how long it'll take me to break even. Meanwhile, this one didn't cost me anything. So I know that I don't need to make any units to break even, right? But still, I can just copy this formula over and it'll do it for me and it will come up with zero because I'm not in the hole and I've started out at zero. 
But knowing that, I mean, we know the point of a difference is 7,500 because we've already done the math of it. But to figure out the point of a difference on this, again, it's going to be equal to this minus this divided by the difference between this and this, okay? Because the revenues doesn't change, so we can ignore that from the equation. So it's going to be equal to, we could open up parentheses and do it. We don't have to do it off to the side. We could say this minus this, close our parentheses, divided by, open our parentheses, this minus this. Once again, it's still 7,500 units. All we did was add the, the profit into this one. If we're going to solve that by hand, again, it's this doesn't factor in. If the revenue is different, you would have to find the difference between both of those as well. So let's say the revenue was different. Let's say uh, we would, because the initial cost was less, we were planning to sell this one for you know, $95, right? So I could do um, this minus this is 150,000. And I could say this minus this is 20. And I could say this minus this is five, right? So the difference here, I could take 150,000 and divide it by the difference here, 15 to figure out a break even. I believe that still works, but I'm not 100% positive because I think, I'll tell you, I'm not 100% positive that actually does work because the one of the main uh, assumptions we learned from the lecture was that um, you're assuming that the revenue is going to be the same per unit. So no, I don't think that does work. Let's ignore that. I'm not going to edit it out. I live with my mistakes. All right. So break even point, let's do this one more time. And then we're gonna look at, uh, this is problem two, by the way, problem two in your um, solve problems, part of the end of chapter five. So break even point, uh, I'm, I'm in the hole for 42,000 a month. And then I'm, I'm gonna make, uh, I don't know how many units yet, but the difference here, revenue is $7 a unit, variable cost is $3 a unit, right? So seven minus three is $4. So basically, I'm in the hole for 42000 a month in rent or whatever it was on the problem. I'm getting out of the hole $4 at a time. So to solve this problem, I'm taking 42000 divided by 4, which is 10500 I think. So right, 40000 divided by 4, 10500 so if I'm doing it by hand, I do it. I do it. Just do it that way. Figure out, you know, right. You know, you have this number written down. Find the difference here. Seven minus three is four. Take forty-two thousand divided by four. That that'll tell you how many you have to sell in order to break even. On Excel equals forty-two thousand divided by the difference. Seven minus three. Ten thousand five hundred units. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now it asks you, well, if I made 10,000 units, how much profit would I have? Knowing that I need 10,500 to break even, we're going to assume this is going to be a negative number, right? I'm going to lose money. And then 12,000 and 15,000, I should be able to make money. All right. So in this, in this one, uh, if I have 10,000 units sold, how much profit am I going to make? Well, profit is equal to total revenue minus total costs. Again, I could take 10,000 units times seven as revenue minus 10,000 units times three variable cost minus 42,000. So I can do that as three steps. I, so to solve this by hand, I could take 10,000 times seven. So seven, um, 70,000 minus 10,000 times three. So 10,000, uh, that's 30,000 minus 42,000, okay? So total revenue, variable costs, fixed costs. 70,000 minus 30,000 minus 42,000, negative 2,000. That's how much I'm going to lose each month. Or I can take um, 10,000 units times the difference and then subtract this out. That's the other way you can figure out total profit. So 10,000 units, and I think it's a faster way, 10,000 units times, the difference here is $4, and then minus 42,000. It's a much faster way of finding profit. So we'll, we'll, consider, we'll continue with that way. It's faster because you're using, you know, um, mathematical shortcuts, 
if it's easier for you to track it, take the extra time and follow the normal formula of total revenue minus variable cost minus fixed cost. Do it in, in those steps. If that if that's what you need to do to keep track of it when you're doing it by hand on your quiz, do that. I give you plenty of time to do the problems on the quiz. Use that time to make sure you get it right. Don't try a shortcut you're not comfortable with, okay? But for Excel purposes, I'm gonna use that. So I'm gonna go 10,000 times the difference, seven minus three. And actually, I'm gonna lock this in. I'm gonna lock in these inputs here. So seven minus three, And I'm also going to subtract out my fixed costs. Okay, the negative two thousand. I can copy this formula down twice. It'll it'll shift this to this, this to this, but it keeps these locked in. That's what those dollar signs are for. If I make twelve thousand units, I get six thousand profit. Fifteen thousand units, I get eighteen thousand profit. Now, finally, the question says, what if I wanted to make an exact amount of profit? Let's say I really need to make. $50,000 in profit each month from this endeavor. Or I said, what do I need to, uh, what's the volume I need for exactly 35,000 in revenue per month? Those are different things. Remember profit and revenue, not the same. So for $50,000 in profit each month, I need to factor in the 50,000, which is gonna be the amount of profit I need plus the fixed cost. Why is that? Well, because uh, uh, basically, because I need 50,000 units or $50,000 in profit, I need to consider the fact that I'm I'm in the hole for $50,000. I need to make back the $42,000 because I've, I owe that money in rent or whatever it was. I need to make $50,000 as well because that's my goal as a company. I need to make $50,000 in profit. So basically the idea is I need to make both of these. I need to make 50,000 and 40,000, which is 92,000. So 50,000, we're gonna open this parentheses up, 50,000 plus 42,000. That's how much I'm effectively in the hole. I'm not really in the hole for uh, 92,000. I'm really in the hole 42,000, but I'm on the hook for 50,000 because you know my boss has told me, you need to make 50,000 profit this month, but you're fired. I don't know why I chose that accent, sorry. Um, <laughs> so that's the, that's what you're on the hook for. Uh, and then divided by how much am I getting out of that hole one unit at a time, which is again, going to be the difference between revenue per unit and variable cost per unit. So I need to make 20, 23,000 units make exactly 50,000 profit. All right. Now, what if I said I needed to make 35,000 revenue per month? This is a, the simplest formula, but it, it's tricky because you're used to this minus this and this divided by this, right? We don't need to figure it. We don't need, we don't care about cost. We don't care about variable cost per unit. There's no this minus this. There's no minus this at the end. Purely revenue. This is the revenue per unit. I need to make 35,000 revenue equals 35,000 revenue divided by $7 revenue per unit. 5,000 units sold will make me $35,000 in revenue. As you can see, even double that, I'm still losing money. So I'm not going to make money here, but we're strictly talking about revenue. And we can plug whatever number we want into that. If I wanted to say, well, how, mu how many do I need to sell to make you know 100,000 in, in revenue? rounded up to the nearest one. You can't make a partial. Although some of the problems later on, you know, I'm gonna have you theorize that you can. All right, so uh, 5,000, um, know, so that's, that's that. All right, so that's all of chapter five work. Now we're gonna look at chapter 5S. This is the one where we have decision-making under certainty, uncertainty, risk. So let me, um, let me get back to this thing here. So um, yeah, let's swap. So decision making under all of these types of possible states of nature, the idea that in the future I might have a low demand, moderate demand, or high demand, and my decision, my the alternatives are 
build a small facility, medium facility, or large facility? What size facility should I build? And so in this situation, I don't have any knowledge ahead of time of the, the likelihood of any of these possible demands. I don't know what my likelihood of low, moderate, or high are going to be, so I have to assume they're all equally likely at this point. Um, and so that's called decision making under uncertainty. And I want to keep stressing this point right here. Decision making under risk only applies if you have probability, if you have odds, if you have percentage chance of, of low, moderate, or high occurring, then it's called decision making under risk. So yes, you're still uncertain, but it's a specific term. Decision making under risk only applies when there's known probabilities assigned to them. All right, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep stressing that point. So the idea here is that we have um, four types of decision-making. Those are gonna be called maxi-min, maxi-max, uh, Laplace, and also, uh, or no, sorry. I looked up the, the pronunciation of it and it's Laplace. It's a French, uh, French sounding uh, pronunciation according to uh, Google's pronunciation guide, Laplace. Which I wouldn't have guessed. I thought it was Laplace or Laplace, but Laplace. Huh. All right, so let's look at those four decision-making criteria uh, based on um, uncertain uh, future. So maximin, you are pessimistic. You are thinking the worst possible outcome is going to occur. Let's not confuse pessimism with wanting it to be bad. Wanting it to be bad and expecting it to be bad are two different things. Okay, you can be pessimistic and still want good things to happen, right? Pessimistic approach is if you are interested in minimizing your risk. I do not want to be risky. Things might go poor. And if they do, I want to lose the least or still make the most that I can. All right. So maxim in is to maximize the maximize the biggest of the of the lowest payouts, right? So if the possible future is either going to be low, moderate, or high, I look at this payout table and I say, if I build a small facility, well, I'm going to make $10 million no matter what. All right? And that sounds okay. I build a medium facility and the future is low. I'm looking at the lowest outcome of these demands, which is $7 million. So we'll just call that one $10 million. $7 million is the lowest here. Negative $4 million is the lowest here. Now, of those three... 10 million is the highest, okay? 10 million is the highest of those three options. So my choice here is to build a small facility. I, I want good things to happen. I expect them to go poorly, all right? Which, you know, should be your approach anytime you enter a casino as well. <laughs> hope, you know, hope for the best, but expect the worst. All right. So you um, you choose to build a small facility because you're going to lose the least. It's the most risk averse decision making you can make. Maxi max is maximize the maximum output. No matter what, you're going for gold. Uh, you know, go big or go home. And in this case, yes, they have it uh, 10 million, 10 million, 10 million, all circled, 12 and 12 circled. They have it all broken down. But realistically, if you were to take all of these here, and just take the highest one out of all of them, you would have the answer, which is 16 million here and build a large facility. Laplace criterion. So in this one, you uh, average them out. This is just averaging what would happen if I build a small facility, I take the average of these three numbers. Well, that averages out to 10 million because they're all the same. If I was to build a medium facility, I average out 7 plus 12 plus 12 divided by 3 is 10.3, okay? Negative 4 plus 2 plus 16, divide that by 3, I get 4.6. So in this case, 10.3 million is the highest. So the highest average payout, because they're all equally likely, the highest average payout, that's what I choose in this case, because on average, I'm likely to make a little bit more with a medium than a small, I'm going to choose to build a medium. And whether I make these decisions really comes down to, to the philosophy of your organization. Are we a risk averse 
organization? Are we going to go for optimization? So optimizing, you're probably going to pick the medium one, unless you have probabilities, and we'll get into that uh, in a second. Finally, we have the minimax regret. Minimax regret is we want to take the, the smallest of all the possible uh, amounts that I would regret my decision. Uh, min minimize the maximum regret. How much could I regret it if I make this decision? Okay. So if I build a you know medium facility, I, I build a medium facility, I make seven million dollars, sweet. But I could have made ten million, right? So I'm going to take the medium facility here, and then down here, I'm going to say I regret it for three million dollars because I could have made ten million. Here I would have, if I build a large facility, I make two million dollars. However, I could have made twelve million. So under large facility, moderate outcome, I regret it to the tune of $10 million because 12 minus two is 10, right? So I'm gonna go through it in Excel in a second, but I'm just, just a quick refresher on how this works. So I build this table and then out of all of the possible regrets, I look at the biggest regret in each row. And then I take the smallest of those, the minimum of the maximum regrets. So the maximum regret on small is six. The maximum regret on medium is four. The maximum regret on large is 14. The smallest, the minimum of those maximums is 4 million. I build a medium facility. Finally, we have EMV and we'll go ahead and do this EMV on Excel. So I'm gonna skip this for now. All right, let me pop back over to Excel. And this says, assume these payoffs represent profits, determine the alternative that would be chosen under each of these decisions, maximin, maximax, Laplace. And then I'm also gonna go ahead and build a minimax regret table and perform EMV. So right here, this, these probabilities, we're ignoring them from now. I'm gonna add those in at the very end and show you how expected monetary value works. So let's look at how we would do this in Excel. Because by hand, it's very you know simple, which is writing down highest or lowest numbers, maxi min. So in this case, what I wanna do is figure out what would be the, um, on, on this one right here, what would be the um, least amount of money I would make if I made a small store? What's, this, what's the least I could possibly make? So I'm gonna use a formula called equals minimum. And the equals min formula is going to just return the smallest value within a given set. So equals min of these two is a dollar, right? Dollar and 14, the smallest of those numbers is a dollar. And I'm gonna copy that down. Now that I know this, okay, I want to know what would be the highest of those outputs, right? What's the highest of these? So in this case, I'm gonna say equals max, because I'm maximizing the minimums. And I'd say $4. And actually, I should have one more line here. And I'm going to say the $4 one matched up with C. So the best choice for me is to build a large store because I'm, even though um, I think in this problem, it was something to the idea of if a, a new bridge is built then a lot of business is going to leave. I'm, not, I'm in a bad area of, of, uh, of town. And if this new bridge is built, then everyone's gonna go over here, right? However, if no new bridge is built, I don't service a lot of, uh, uh, of, of people in the town. So by building a small store, it, it's good. Um, I don't know, these are weird numbers. They don't really make sense for the, I'm trying my best to, to make sense out of a poorly written problem, uh, just from the, the you know, the, the, the flavor of the, the problem as it's written. But that's the idea that there's, you know, these, these real wonky payout tables. This is not a usual uh, payout table where, you know, this goes up and this goes down. But anywho, uh, especially with a large size store, but all right, regardless. So um, that's the idea is that uh, if whatever happens, happens and these possible states of nature, this is one of them is good, potentially one of them is bad. Um, the fact that it's a small store, you'd make more money if no new bridge is built. That's the weird part, but maybe just based on the cost or something, right? Okay, so the best choice if uh, if if things go poorly, 
and no and, and the new bridge ends up getting built and, and that's bad for us for whatever reason then the large store is the best outcome of the bad choices sure maxi max and this one i want to maximize all my results so i'm gonna take the maximum of these two copy that down and here i want to maximize what's above me on this table max the max fourteen dollars that matches up with this so i would say small store that's my choice <laughs> Realistically, yes, you could do equals max of all of these because it, it will always come out to be the same, but for the purposes of showing it and what's happening, you're maximizing the maximum. Max of max is equals max on equals max. Laplace is an average, so I'm going to do equals average and average these two. Copy that down. And you always want to maximize your averages. So I'm going to do equal max on these three. That's 750. And that's going to be equal to small store. Mini max regret. So this one, we have to build the opportunity loss table. It's not one of the ones asked, but um, oh no, yeah, it, it is. It was a uh, part A on the, the next step. So we're going to build a, a opportunity loss table. The idea here, again, is that if I choose uh, one of the options and I could have made more with another one Then I regret that decision, right? So in this one, I wanna take each, I wanna take the highest number in the column and then subtract from that whatever uh, cell I'm currently on. So if I'm doing this by hand, the highest number in this column is four. So four minus one is three, four minus two is two, four minus four is zero. That's what that will look like if I'm doing it by hand and I'm filling it out on my own. Okay. And, and why don't we go ahead and just do the whole problem by hand, all right? So 14, the highest number in this column is 14. 14 minus 14 is zero. 14 minus 10 is four. Oops. And then 14 minus six is eight. So I can do this all by hand, no problem. I'm just... Pretend I'm writing this out on a, on a piece of scratch paper, taking the quiz, right? I'm building this out. Now from here, what I wanna take is the highest number between each of these outcomes for the alternative. So the highest number here is three. So I would write, I would just write down $3. The highest number here is four and the highest number here is eight. But I wanna minimize my regrets. If I build a small store, I might regret it for $3. If I build a medium store, I might have $4 worth of regret. If I build a large store, I could potentially have $8 worth of regret. And I wanna minimize, minimize the maximum regrets. So these are the maximum regrets and I wanna minimize those maximums, All right? So to do that, I just take the smallest of the highest regrets. That's $3, which means I'm gonna build a small store. Let's do this very quickly in Excel. So I'm gonna take the highest number in this column. So maximum of this, lock that in. And then from the maximum of that column, I'm gonna subtract out the matching cell. So this is the top left cell. I'm gonna just click on this cell right here, hit enter, and then copy that down. Do the same thing here. Take the maximum value of this column, lock it in, close my parentheses, minus the same cell that matches. No, no regrets there. No regrets, that too. All right, and then from here, now that I've built my opportunity loss table, I take the maximum regrets from each of them. So equals max between these two. I would have $3 of regret on a small store, right? And I can copy these down, no need to lock them in. $4 regret on a medium store, $8 regret on a large store. And I want to take the minimum. We're minimizing the maximum regrets. The minimum of these is three, and that matches up with small store. Now let's quickly look at what EMV is. EMV is expected monetary value. It's a formula when we have probabilities. This is decision-making under risk. Risk only applies when we're given probabilities. Yes, these are all risky too, right? So if it wasn't a specific term in the book, in business, in decision-making, yeah, these are 
under risk because they're risky. But terminology wise, these all four were under uncertainty. EMV is the only one that's under risk that we're going to cover. So under risk, there's a 60% chance that this happens. There's a 40% chance that this happens. So what we want to do is we want to take 60% times this plus 40% times this. So I can do this by hand by doing 0.6 times 1. I would write down 0.6. And then 40%, 0.4 times 14, 5.6. And then add those two together, 6.2. You get 6.2, right? So 6.2 is my expected value. Not very high because this drops it down a lot, right? If I want to do this in Excel, though, instead of doing a long formula, because I'm not always going to have just two cells I'm comparing, I'm going to write an equal sum product. Sum, again, is the answer to an addition problem. Product is the answer to a multiplication product. I'm summing the products. I'm multiplying them, I'm multiplying them, and I'm adding them together. All right, so sum product equals, choose the array you're going to multiply. So 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.4, these probabilities, and let's lock in those probabilities. Now I'm going to multiply them by the same cells matching up, left, the left one, then the right one, right here. So it knows to do the 60% times 1 plus 40% times 14 for us. And I get, oops, <laughs> I did something wrong when I wasn't looking, some product I did, uh, yeah, this comma, sorry, I locked it in, comma, I did, I closed my parentheses and multiplied for some reason, yeah, this is how you do a sum product for real, <laughs> you do a comma in between your arrays, so this array, lock it in, comma, this array, hit enter, 620, the same answer we got before, copy it down, what did I not do, oh, I must have hit on this array, I must have hit the dollar sign twice because it only locked in the last one. Try it one more time. This one, lock it in, comma, this one, third time's a charm, copy that down, here we go. So we've got an expected outcome of 620, 520, and 480. We always want to maximize with an EMV formula. The highest of those is 620, so I'm still choosing small store. Now let's look at a thing called perfect information, the idea that there might be a research company or advanced analytics or whatever that can is so knowledgeable, they have a good chance of discovering for you. Um, they know the they know what's going to happen. You don't know the you don't know what's going to happen, but they do. And they've stored that information in an envelope. And I like to use the envelope analogy just to make it make sense. What's the value of perfect information, right? If I bought the, a perfect forecast of the future. How much would I pay for that? Okay. So with this one, what we can do is we can figure out if I knew that um, there was a 60% chance of this, 40% chance of this, and those probabilities are the same, right? There's still a 60% chance that there's no, that there's going to be a new bridge built. There's still a 40% chance that there's no new, new bridge built. But if I knew that ahead of time, then I could choose to either build a small, medium, or large store. And how much money would I make if I knew that? There's still the equal chance of the envelope containing either of them. But once I've opened the envelope, I can then make this decision instead of this one. All right. So to figure out the value of perfect information, I first need to figure out what's the value with perfect information. Of perfect information and with perfect information are two separate things, including the information of that envelope. I can make a good, a better decision. So to figure that out, I'm just gonna write it off to the side here. The value of perfect information would be equal to 60% chance times the highest number here, right? So I could say 60% times the maximum of this, $2.40, and then 40% times the maximum here. So I can just copy that over. And then add those together. Eight dollars is my expected monetary value if I had perfect information. Let's do that by hand just to show you one more time what's happening here. 
there's still a 60% chance that it says new that it says a new bridge will be built. Right? Those probabilities don't change, but once I know that, I can choose the best outcome here, which is to build a large store. So I open the envelope and it says, there's going to be a new bridge. Okay, let's build a large store. Same thing here. No, if I knew for sure that we were not going to be building that new bridge, I'm going to build a small store. So the likelihood of this times the highest number here, plus the likelihood of this times the highest number here. That's what I could do if I had perfect information about the, the future. Okay. 26 times 4, which is the highest, 240. You can see it's written down there. 0.4 times 14. You can see that's the highest under new bridge. No new bridge. 560. You add them together. $8 is the expected value with perfect information. And I would write that down as EV with perfect information. That's how you'll see that. That's how you see that abbreviated. EV, lowercase wpi. The expected value of perfect information is a different story. That's how much is that envelope worth? And it can be uh, found by finding the difference between the expected value with and the expected value without. The expected value without was 620. The expected value of perfect information is equal to expected value with it minus expected value without it. $1.80 is the expected value of the perfect information. So I could reasonably pay up to $1.80, which is probably 1.8 million or whatever, um, for a forecast of the future. Obviously, I'm not going to pay that much because why would I do that when I'm not gaining anything? I would be just as good not risking that. So, but I might pay 100000 to try to make up to $1.8 million more, right? Might pay two hundred. dollars might pay a quarter of that, might pay a million, I don't know, up to the company. But it's the idea of, of how much could you pay for that research from a specialist or something like, something along those lines, right? It could be surveying, it'd be, okay, we're going to actually pull every, um, you know, every person that's voting and, and get a better idea. And then you're, you're going to hire a company to do the the polling because you're, you're they're, they're going to vote on, a, um, on whether or not the bridge gets built, right? So that's the kind of thing you might pay for, for better knowledge of the future, more likelihood. Overwhelmingly, the, the surveys, the polls say that uh, no new bridge is going to be built. Okay. But, you know, that's the idea there. So that's really, the, that's the chapter. Um, if we had, you could do the EVPI, it says using the regret table, it comes out to the same thing. You would do 60% times the um, um, highest regrets here, and then same thing end up, ends up happening. So um all right that's it that's the chapter and please let me know as always if you have any questions whatsoever